Very warm welcome from the Konrad Adenauer Foundation Stockholm. Our topic of today is the Konrad Adenauer's legacy, the lessons from Konrad Adenauer's political philosophy and work for the politics of, of today. Yeah, my name is Gabriele Baumann and I'm the head of the uh, Konrad Adenauer uh, Stiftung's office in Stockholm covering the Nordic countries. Our main goal is to deepen the European uh, the European cooperation, and we are doing seminars and conferences to share positions and opinions among member, members of parliaments, uh, young politicians from the center right. It's also um, our mission to, of course, talk about politics and, and trust about the topics of participation, representation, in a democracy. And we are very much and have been very much focusing on Christian democracy in the past years. We have had a couple of seminars on that topic. So we have been speaking about the Nordic variations of Christian democracy. We are also um, doing together with a Norwegian think tank an anthology about Christian democracy in Europe, which will be published by the end of this year. Uh, so we have been comparing Christian democracy or Christian democratic parties in Northern Europe. We have been doing uh, quite, quite a few seminars on the German elections last year. And of course, um, working together with think tanks in Sweden and in Norway on that topics. One, I think, uh, really uh, challenging topic was also the, the question of Christian democracy and the challenge of right wing populism in the North. So what can be generally learned from the legacy of Christian democratic parties now to tackle the challenges we are facing today? And I would like to uh, also say that this event today is in cooperation between the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, the Nordic countries, and the Swedish think tank Civitas. I would uh, warmly like to warmly welcome our distinguished speakers. It's uh, Dr. Per Landgren. He is the board member of the Swedish think tank Civitas, and he's also the associate member of the history faculty at the University of Oxford and editor of the recently published Swedish anthology. Chris Demokratie, Meni Hossin, Etik Politik. Then I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Mikhail Borchardt. He is uh, the direct director of the scientific department of the Konrad Adenauer Foundation and director of the archive of the Christian Democratic Union in Germany and the International Archive of Christian Democracy also Secretary General of the Forum of Archives and Research on Christian Democracy. Once again, very warm welcome. And now I would like to give the floor first to Dr. Uh, per Landgren to give us, to give us an, uh, an input on, on the topic we uh, which first named, what can we learn from Adenauer's political philosophy and his ideological uh, convictions. Um, we have 10 minutes for each speaker, and after that, we have the possibility to discuss a little bit further on until uh, a quarter, uh, quarter to two. Hmm. Dr. Perlanken, I would like to give you the floor now. Many thanks, and uh, I'm glad for the cooperation between the CAS, the uh, Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, and Civitas. So, after the Second World War, influential academics in the Federal Republic of Germany wanted to come to terms with the catastrophe. The original catastrophe was not the lost war. The war was a catastrophe in itself for so many countries and of course for Germany. But the catastrophe in this context was the takeover by the National Socialist. How could it have happened? Scholars try to understand and explain the development from the Reformation and the Enlightenment to Bismarck, World War I, the Treaty of Versailles and the takeover of the National Socialist Party. They included the first, these scholars, 
the first headmaster of the Free University in West Berlin, Friedrich Meinecke, with the book, The Deutsche Katastrophe. Historians such as Gerhard Ritter with Europe and the Deutsche Frage, Hannah Arendt with the origins of totalitarianism, Reinhard Koselek with Kritik und Krise, and social scientists uh, as Max Horkheimer and Theodor Adorno with Dialectik der Aufklärung. Adenauer's legacy includes an analysis, but perhaps even more a down to earth practical political agenda in rebuilding a nation on a better foundation. What the others did theoretically, Adenauer did practically, but not without a theoretical foundation. I just propose here that his political legacy in this regard should be recognized much more and set on a par with these academics, to say the least. I will now mention three foundational lessons that we can draw from Adenauer's legacy. My immediate source is uh, volume one of his memories, Erinnerungen. Uh, the lessons are foundational, probably. Most other important lessons can be deduced from these basic ones. In a book from Kivitas, Kristdemokrati, Människosyn, Etik och Politik, recently published by Timbro, as we heard, with 10 authors and 13 chapters, the focus is directed on these foundational is issues and lessons in Christian democratic political philosophy. In this book, so to speak, Adenauer's legacy is alive. But now to the lessons. Lesson one, the foundational significance of a world view. According to Adenauer, it was absolutely necessary to find the deep causes why Germany had fallen in this awful pit, if Germany was to be taken out of it. To begin with, Adenauer argued that the materialist worldview, materialistische Weltanschauung, was behind the political philosophies of national socialism, Nazism, it was behind communism, and also behind the kind of liberalism we had in the Weimar Republic. Philosophical materialism was behind them all, and that is not a good foundation, Adenauer thought, for any state or community. Adenauer wanted to build Germany on a Christian foundation, that is to say, on a, a Christian view of man and Christian ethics. The following two fundamental lessons can be deduced from this first one. Lesson two then. The foundational significance of the view of human beings, beings that recognizes and affirms the worth and dignity of man. This significance is fundamentally in any kind of social fellowship. Adenauer writes that materialism depersonalizes depersonalizes human beings who become cogs in a big machinery. He also pinpoints racial biology with according, which according to science in those days implied that Germans or Aryans, Swedes also, belong to a Herrenrasse and Herrenvolk and that other people were less valuable and partly worthy of extermination. Vernichtungswürdig, uh, wrote Adenauer. In the first chapter of the book Christdemokratie, Menichusin Ethik und Politik, I call this the moral breakdown in Europe. Other continents were, were had, had this breakdown as well. I, and I exemplify with racial biology and I would say its counterpart in jurisprudence and law. Nihilism. Materialism also strengthened a false view, according to Adenauer, of the state vis-a-vis -vis its citizens. In Germany, the state had been given a divine status and the individu individual person's value and worth had been sacrificed. Page 44 in the Erinnerungen. Adenauer stressed the contrast. The human person must come before the state in status. 
the worth, liberal and individual autonomy are the borders and point of orientation for the state. Lesson three, the foundational significance of a viable ethics. An absolute prerequisite, prerequisite for a healthy society is an ethic that treats human beings as persons. Adenauer mentions Christian natural law, but describes it more practically than theoretically, more perhaps about the duty of the state to foster liberty and responsibility in the youth in order that they should follow a Christian and democratic spirit. So far, these three foundational lessons. Other important lessons, such as his early conviction that French, Belgian and German industries should be integrated and intertwined and to develop a social market and the G German economic miracle after World War II are also ramifications from these basic lessons, I think. The consequences of Adenauer's Christian ethics was justice, forgiveness, reconciliation, and that is atonement in the etymological meaning of being at one again. The people in Germany and internationally needed to be at one again. This agenda was both international between peoples and in Germany between individuals. The majority of the German people had ended up in supporting the National Socialist. Was reconciliation, versöhnung even possible? In Christian democracy, reconciliation is a logical application of Christian ethics and natural law. There is no, no law-bound conflict between peoples, races, classes, sexes, or individuals. Among free and responsible peoples, races, classes, sexes, and individuals ought to, ought to support justice, perform justice, forgiveness, and reconciliation. That should be practiced to solve conflicts. Adenauer stressed the Christian worldview and the Christian view of human beings, but in his analysis, there is also a confirmation of natural law and personalism which opens up for a constructive dialogue with contenders of other worldviews. This is our focus in Christdemokrati also in the book that the common view of human persons and human rights that we have in political, we have them already in political declara declarations of human rights, such as the United Nations Declaration and the European Convention. We just all have to learn the lesson that a materialistic worldview can undermine and undercut it all. These three fundamental lessons are elaborated in the 10 chapters of Kristdemokrati, uh, as well, of course, in, in Adenauer's Erinnerungen. These are on uh, Christian democratic political philosophy in our book, the history of Christian democracy, uh, both uh, uh, the history and, and uh, and uh, the parties nowadays, and internationally, the history and in Sweden, the separation of religion and state, natural law, personalism, the imperfection of man, subsidiarity, natural communities, solidarity, trusteeships, and social market economy. Parallels also to the Deutsche Frage, the German question could be drawn to today's Russia with its totalitarian system. Important lesson can be had here from the philosophical and political legacy of Konrad Adenauer. Now Europe and Russia and the Russische Frage needs politicians of Adenauer's stature. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Langren. That was very comprehensive and very clear also your message. And thank you for naming again the uh, the most important lessons you do out of the book Christ Demokratie, which is really very essential. And I hope that uh, this will also be uh, interesting for, for those who listen to us today in order to, to, to uh, read uh, the book. And also thank you for, for naming uh, the Erinnerungen of 
so the memories of Konrad Adenauer and, and other books. So I would now like to forward uh, to Dr. Michael Borchert, uh, who has uh, been working on, um, on the legacy of, of Konrad Adenauer for, for many, many years. And I uh, know that Tina wants to also talk about uh, some lessons we can draw out from history, from his legacy, but also give an outlook on what just uh, Dr. Landke just said to uh, adapt also his thinking and his uh, opinions to what we face today. I mean, the Russische Frage, uh, if that is possible. Yeah, Michael Borcher, do you have the floor, please? Uh, I will try to do that. Um, uh, thank you, Per, for your very valuable thoughts. Uh, my focus will be a little bit more on the practical effects, not only of Adenauer's policy, but also of the party. He influenced so much the CDU. Uh, and I think that's uh, quite important uh, to see. Um, there is a meaningful Chinese curse you might be familiar with. May you live in interesting times. And I think it's pretty obvious why this is not just uh, a quote, but a curse. Uh, we live in times that are anything but easy. Uh, and I would not dream of talking down the, the war of aggression in Ukraine, the corona crisis, uh, uh, the climate catastrophe. But, but part of the truth is also to realize, and you did that very clear, uh, pair, to realize the cesura that finally brought about one of the most successful Christian democratic parties the complete moral, physical, psychological downfall in Germany uh, and the widespread uh, devastation of, of all of Europe. Uh, I think that is very important to see this very, very big caesura once again. And I think it's very important to see that uh, uh, in this very seemingly hopeless situation, uh, uh, kind of a revolution uh, occurred in, German, in the German party system uh, that would not only shape uh, Germany uh, for the rest of the century, but also would uh, really very much influence the European uh, party system. Uh, in Cologne and in Berlin, uh, but also at many other places, and that's very important to see, there was no central act of founding the CDU, but there have been a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, uh, initiations of the CDU uh, um, and, and Konrad Adenauer, one has to say, was not directly involved in the acute founding of the party, uh, uh, especially in Cologne, uh, but he described the situ situation very drastically. And he said the founding of a new party was difficult in view of the bleak situation that existed in Germany. Uh, and he said it took a lot of courage to rebuild one of the former parties, even greater courage to found a new party, uh, end of quote. Even more so, I think it took courage to found a party that had not existed in this form before. Uh, and uh, um, um, I think uh, that the actually new factor of the democratic new beginning uh, of 1945, as the historian Karl Dietrich Bracher, you named a lot of important historians and uh, important uh, uh, um, uh, philosophers, but I think Karl Dietrich Bracher is also a very eminent and important figure. He spoke of a supernova in the political starry sky. Uh, and I think what, the, what made the CDU and, and uh, its Bavarian sister, the CSU, so very special and made them shine so much brighter than all other new or reestablished parties at that time was the explicit reference to the Christian image of man. Uh, that's the first point. But the second point, I think, is also very important the CDU, and you didn't name that so far, the CDU constituted itself as a rallying party, uh, um, uh, establishing, thus establishing for the first time in Germany, a truly people's party, a truly people's party aimed at all strata, at all sections of the population, from the Christian socialist to the liberal, to the conservative nationalist uh, sections of the population from the trade union camp to the business camp, quite in contrast to the uh, social democrats, which even after the war initially very consciously continued uh, its old and already venerable tra tradition as a class party, as a workers party. Thirdly, the party fulfilled a dream, and that's very important too, that some people like Konrad Adenauer and like Adam Stegerwald 
had already dreamt more or less allowed during the time of the Weimar Republic, the dream of a party that would overcome the opposition between the Catholic and the Protestant confessions, which, and that I think has to be said very clearly, which had prevented the Christian oriented parties in the Weimar period from, uh, from being uh, able to really effectively oppose the extremists. And this is what Adenauer clearly said. He said, uh, if we would have stand much more together, we would have uh, achieved much more. This dream had not been abandoned even in the times of national socialist tyranny. It lived on in the resistance, which prompted the resistance fighter and later CDU politician and Bundestag president Eugen Gerstenmeier to use the formula according to which the constitution of the CDU began in the presence of Tegel. And that's very important to say too. Konrad Adenauer was not a member of the resistance, but he also suffered persecution during the Nazi period. And they drew the conclusion from the failure of the parties in the Weimar Republic that only a new party rooted in the broad Christian soil on firm ethical principles supported by all strata of the German people would be able to raise Germany again from its distress." End of quote. He had in mind a party that would not promote fragmentation into particular interests, regardless of what, whatever they were uh, sectarian, economic, or ideological, but a rallying movement that would unite as many Democrats as possible under one roof. Even though Adenauer was quickly the central figure uh, and quickly made his mark on the CDU, it was noteworthy that the CDU in the beginning uh, took into account a general will of change, which can be seen in the fact that it, did, as I said, that it did not have one central founding act, but was formed at several places at the same time the individual founding acts also expressed certain directions in the Cologne guidelines, and they are very important. And there are a lot of similarities between the Cologne guidelines of the party and the later Grundgesetz. Uh, it was the Christian trade unionists who dreamt of a Christian socialism, who were strongly oriented toward Catholic social ethics. In Berlin, the interdenominational approach was much more clearly expressed and in the Frankfurt guiding principles, the market economy. Konrad Adenauer's merit is to have combined these directions into a consistent narrative uh, until the constitution of the Federal Republic by consistently seeking the middle ground. And I think this is the middle ground that's very important. To the end of his life, he would denounce what he called materialism. You said that very clear as a fundamental evil that had led to the failure of the Weimar Republic and into the Nazi state. At the same time, he left Erhard very practical, ample room to develop his economic policy ideas, which were based on a rules-based yet competition-oriented economy uh, as a so-called third way between capitalism and socialism. Adenauer always sought the middle ground. He had perhaps almost traumatic experience of polarization during the Weimar period. And, and I think that's very important to see. He who had uh, at that time was already something of a beacon of hope for the center, for the center party, experienced the relative powerlessness of the more moderate and liberal parties because this spectrum allowed itself to be fragmented and segmented, thus making it easier for the national socialists to seize power. From this, he quite pragmatically drew the conclusion that the balance between ideological positions is so important. Incidentally, this has also become clear in the matter of Christian orientation. There is the nice story that his later successor as CDU chairman, Rainer Batzel, wanted to orient the CDU more strongly toward the Ten Commandments. Uh, he did that in the early beginning of the 60s. Uh, and the will of Barzel was to strengthen the Christian idea. Adenauer, however, who had always been a very devout Catholic, was very quick to recognize the dangers uh, inherent in this uh, undertaking and made it unmistakably clear to him. He said, quote, since church thinking is now rapidly declining among our people, and we are consequently dependent on it and must reckon with the fact that we will also get the so-called liberals to join us. We must be careful not to do anything that might deter the liberals of both denominations from voting for us. 
Without the liberal votes, we cannot get a majority in Germany. I always think when I read such a sentence of an average Catholic or a Protestant liberal, when he now reads, we place our politics under God's commandment, I have to tell you honestly, that's a little bit embarrassing to me. And I repeat, we don't do it. We don't do it after all. Gentlemen, let's not be fooled here. We are not acting against God's commandments, but we are not putting our policy under God's commandments either. That's a central sentence in the thinking of, uh, of Adenauer. And this is also very much part of Adenauer's legacy to understand the Christian image of man as a projection surface in cultural and social rather than religious terms, and thus to make it very clear to us, even those who believe nothing at all, who are Muslims, who belong to any religion can be enthusiastic about Christian democracy as long as they can support the conclusions that result from the Christian image of man. In our diverse societies, I think this is very important. Uh, no theoretical idea in the history of ideas has had such an overriding structural effect in Germany, even in terms of constitutional law, as the concept of human dignity, which is the most important and unchangeable normative definition of our constitution. The fact that this idea and with it the idea of the personhood of man has become so strong can be traced back quite clearly to Adenauer. And let me just elaborate a last uh, idea. As eager as Adenauer was to strike a balance, he was very, very clear in his foreign policy visions. And this is perhaps the most important lesson for our time and for the, uh, as you called it, uh, uh, Gabriele, the, the Russia question. Uh, personally, I, I must confess that I always considered the sentence of the social democratic German chancellor Helmut Schmidt, who said, who has visions should go to the doctor and not into politics to be a rather foolish sentence. What was special about Konrad Adenauer was that he was a mixture of real politician and visionary that is still unique today. Visionary because he dared to take steps that hardly seemed imaginable. And you said that uh, very clearly, Per. Uh, European rapprochement, reconciliation with France, rapprochement with Israel via the reparations agreement, that's also very important to say. And he always had a mixture of ideological, moral, and pragmatic intentions, which were primarily geared toward feasibility and practicability and their important and their political implementation. That's very important to see too. This has occasionally been defamed as chancellor's democracy, and the CDU likes to be defamed as a chancellor's electoral association. But that misses one point enormously. We tend to see events with our own glasses without putting ourselves in the time. From today's per perspective, it seems logical, even clear to draw the lessons of European cooperation from the war. At that time, the resistance to this project and above all the danger that Germany and Europe would be pulverized between the fronts in the Cold War struggle of interests was quite enormous. In this respect, Adenauer's foreign policy approaches were just as revolutionary as the founding of the CDU itself was revolutionary. Never before had Germany, German foreign policy firstly been so clearly defined as with the West been known, knowing that security for Europe and for Germany could not be guaranteed without close ties to the United States. But Adenauer also remained always very skeptical of his own people. When Konrad Adenauer first considered European integration shortly after the war, initially on his own, and long before the Federal Republic was constituted, together with other great European Christian Democrats such as Robert Schumann and Alcide de Gasperi, it was of paramount importance to him to make it clear that Germany would abide by the rules it had previously trampled on. Respect for international borders, clear and transparent foreign policy principles, respect for obligations under international law, strict adherence to treaties. And that's maybe one uh, of the lessons for the, for the Russia question you just named. Perhaps the strongest lesson of his foreign policy for today, for our time when multilateral structures are derided by, by people like, uh, like Putin, even considered to be weak, is to do everything possible to strengthen these very structures at all costs. If Adenauer were standing before us today, he would intervene in the debate about the final finality of Europe 
with a clear compass and despite all understanding for national interests, and he always, of course, was also a national politician, he would make it crystal clear that there can be no alternative to a deep political union. Only close interdependence that goes beyond purely economic cooperation will lead us to a situation in which first, the harm of using warlike means is greater than the benefit, and second, in which nationalism and national egoism run counter to our own economic and social interests. Perhaps one of Adenauer's most beautiful quotes, and I always have to quote him uh, so that I don't get fired, uh, is uh, he said, when the others think you are finished, then you have to really start new. If there is a lesson for us from Putin's war of aggression, it is what we must become even more resolute, even more decisive, in matters of European policy. Adenauer, with all his awareness of the difficulties of the concrete process, would not have responded to the Ukrainians' aspiration for candidate status in the EU with misgivings or with uh, some kinds of reluctance, but with enthusiasm. And he would have seen it as a confirmation that the EU makes perfect sense. Now we must clearly see the opportunities that this situation also offers for reviving a certain enthusiasm for the European idea. And this, by the way, is perhaps the clearest difference from the times of Adenauer. At that time, there was the fear that Germany would again become overpowering. Uh, today, there is a fear that Germany is far too reluctant when it comes to defending freedom. We in Germany probably have to realize this responsibility anew in the spirit of Aden. That's it. Mm, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. That was really a great, uh, great uh, input. And um, I think we all took so many notes out of it. We need, uh, we need a person like Konrad Adenauer now in order to, to make that clear once and once again, in order to as you said, uh, to uh, to defend freedom and, and and solve the conflicts we have uh, we have globally right now in order to go also be more resolute in European policy. Thank you very much. And I would also like to remind the audience that we have the opportunity for another ten minutes uh, to ask uh, questions or or give uh, give comments on what you have just been just heard. Uh, but we also have this recorded on YouTube, so you always can uh, listen to the two speeches um, again. Uh, I would like to ask you, um, uh, Pelinkin, do you, Lankoen, do you have any any anything to comment on what uh, Michael Borch had, uh, just said? Because I think you your two speeches really fit it very well, uh, I... and, and and I think you you might want to might want to, to, to command or even go a bit uh, further, maybe also elaborate on Swedish politics, on the question of the uh, Swedish Christian Democratic uh, Party. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm really thankful for, for uh, Michael's uh, uh, lecture. And I think, as you said, it really fitted. And I, I, I thought that the, the strategy from Adenauer not to to stress like like say the the ten commandments and so on uh, because the situation in 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 his country in in your country in Germany and in Sweden is is different from before we 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 have a secularized country and we we need to to find common ground uh, just as Adenauer did. So I just wanted to say that in, in the book that I, we referred to, uh, this Christ Demokrati, we, we, we have this strategy that you, you can have both theological arguments and philosophical arguments. But if you don't agree on the basis for theology as a discipline, then you have to use the philosophical arguments. Uh, it, it could be as easy like that. So. In that case, a Christian Democrat sh should talk perhaps more about personalism than about Christian view of man. Uh, even though he, he or she doesn't deny the, the, the Christian basis, but personalism is a philosophical way of explaining what 
what makes human life, what makes, uh, creates the dignity and the worth of human life. And also um, uh, Christian ethics that we, we sh stresses in the book, Natural Law, because that is, one could say, uh, an ethic that starts in, in what is typical or uh, for, for human beings, the, the nature of human beings. The, the problem for a materialist is that he has or she has to deny uh, uh, so many things that are important in human lives, like, uh, you know, like thoughts, uh, like love and all kinds of feelings. And uh, it, it cannot be explained only by by accidental firework in our brains, uh, one could say. So then we talk about natural law, and I think that's a a, 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 a good way of of uh, finding the common ground. So uh, that was a very interesting point, and I also think that that Michael's uh, um, uh, view about the future, or what's needed here, fitted in 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 my lecture as well. Yeah, I, I agree totally. Thank you so much uh, for commenting. Mm -hmm. And now we also have, um, to, in order to follow up the discussion a bit, we have a, a question from the audience. Um, and I think I would like to um, forward this to, to Michael Borchardt. How, how does Adenauer's ideal of a um, People's Party translate to Nordic political spectrum as we have here in the centrist uh, the, the center right, we have um, the conservative and the Christian Democratic Party. So, uh, yeah, how does it relate? Because in all Nordic countries, we have two uh, center right parties. In, in, in Germany, we have the CDU, which combines, uh, so to say, these two parties. How would you how would you see uh, that? Um, Yes, and there's another question. How does this cope with the postmodern and late modernity perspectives? Uh, I don't know. Um, yeah, it's probably what we see uh, now afterwards, after we have a secularized um, state, especially in Sweden. But, but, but why don't you start? I mean, uh, Michael and then uh, Pia on, on, that, on these two questions, please. Well, well, first, I have to admit that I'm far away from being a, an expert on the Scandinavian, uh, uh, the Nordic political spectrum and the, the party system. Uh, and I would never dare to compare our 20s uh, in this century with the 20s 100 years ago, but there are some similarities. And this would be my answer to the question. Uh, the problem of the Weimar Republic was not so much its uh, structural weaknesses. And these structural weaknesses are always being stressed. Uh, it was uh, a, a rather strong pre president, rather weak uh, uh, parliamentarian system, uh, rather weak uh, sets of, uh, set of rules and laws. Mm -hmm. But that was not the problem, I have to say. That was only part of the problem. The problem was that the Weimar times were very, very polarized. Uh, very polarized, uh, and the middle of the, the centrist parties and the moderate and the liberal parties were very, very much fragmented. And I would say that there are some similarities. The problem that we have extremists on both sides and that we have, I would call it external pressure. Uh, uh, if you look at Putin and, and other factors that we have these extremists. And, and uh, I mean, if you look at the French, uh, uh, elections, uh, uh, still uh, the Front National is very, very, uh, very successful. Uh, I would say that it is very, very important that the centrist uh, parties, the centrist political forces would work together uh, and uh, to form coalitions, to form whatever kind of uh, 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 bounds uh, you, can, you can form, because this is the only way to fight the fringes, uh, and uh, may, maybe this is a, a rather banal and, and a rather superficial answer, and this is due to the fact that I'm not so familiar with the with party system, but but I think this lesson is very very important uh, that we have to strengthen the the middle, uh, and and this would be also Adenauer's uh, I, I would say lesson 
how does this cope with postmodern, late modernity uh, perspectives? Um, I think we have to face the fact, which, besides the fact that we are in a very polarized situation, uh, uh, we have also to face the fact that our, uh, um, uh, our societies, again, are very segmented. Uh, and, and, uh, and this segmentation really calls for what I would call people's parties. Uh, I'm not naive here. I know that uh, we have the situation that the younger generation, the so-called Generation Y or this Generation Z, uh, has much difficulties to bind itself to, let's say, trade unions, uh, big parties, big movements, uh, and there's a more or less individual approach. Uh, but uh, uh, I think still, uh, uh, even if you take the weaknesses of the people's parties into account, uh, the people parties are the only way to bridge these segments and to bridge these polarized thinkings and to make a rather, rather uh, liberal and a rather, let's say, moderate uh, approach out of it. And that also is a good way to cope with these uh, modernity perspectives, uh, uh, because we will never have, again, a situation in which we have a very, very broad consensus. Uh, the future will be a more segmented society, a more individual society. We can't, I think we can't uh, return this, uh, 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 and, and we can't reframe this. So we have to deal with it. And there, I'm still convinced uh, as I uh, have to stress once again, that besides all its weaknesses, these, this, this, this is why it was for me so important to put besides the, the ideological thinking and the worldview thinking of Adenauer to put very clear to the table that this concept of the people's party is so very, very important. Thank you so much. We take this as a con conclusion uh, and referring to the question from, from your side, Michael Borchert. And now, Pierre Lang, can you have also, two minutes in order to, yes. to refer to this question, please. Well, well I, I think there is, uh, we don't have to despair. I mean, as far as I have understood postmodernism, uh, the world is fragmented, and even the ethics and the views of man are, are fragmented. But when we start with, with the nature of human beings, it's pretty much the same kinds of needs and the same kinds of, of things that we want to fulfill. Uh, and we know that we need it for a society to flourish. So for instance, when we now listen to Putin, we, we, are, uh, we don't like that he lies. He lies to his own people. He, he lies internationally. He, he, it's just during the communist time you know, the Velvet Revolution in Czechoslovakia, they wanted to have the real truth and not the Pravda. And, and that is something in our nature that we don't want people around us to lie to us. And then we shouldn't lie to them because then we can't live together. Uh, so I think that natural law thinking gives hope from the nature of man. I, I don't say that it's easy and, and we, often are egoistic and we think of ourselves and we want to have more money and all that kinds of problems. But still, the basic needs, you know, sometimes in when we have catastrophes, people help each other. In that kind of need, we, we can see what, what really natural, natural, naturally, I am in Scott, but we say in Swedish, what natural communities can do. So, so I, I think there is hope. Every party wants to be, uh, I think, uh, a, a people's party. And then they can't then, you know, focus on intellectuals or focus on, you know, academics or, or farmers or so on. So we have three liberal parties in Sweden. I'm not sure we have a conservative party. I, I would say that Christian democracy is sometimes conservative because we, we have, we, we try to defend absolute values like freedom not, not just one freedom um let's say life first health uh, freedom and truth and and love and all that kinds of of values basic values that are fundamental for human beings so we have the last question 
some people put an equal time between Christian democracy and Pantera. I, I, I wouldn't say it's not equal. I mean, Christian democracy in Sweden, we don't defend the state church system. Uh, that was one of the original tenets, well, 50 years ago or something like that. So uh, modern conservative says that you have to look around to see what, what's its, what we should conserve. Uh, and 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 in in natural law thinking and in in a personalistic view of man, you have some absolutes, and that's not that's not just conservatism. We don't change on those issues, and then we can be radical, go to the roots, radix in other cases. So Christian democracy, we can have conservatives in our party, but we are more than a conservative party. We are a Christian democratic party, or let's say now then in modern terms. We, we have personalism and natural law as our definite uh, presuppositions or as our, as our basis. Thank you so much. I think Michael Borchardt wants to add something yeah, to that. Uh, on, on the question of uh, the, the, uh, the, the Christian democracy and conservatism and, and the relation, uh, we have a very clear statement that uh, the CDU has three roots. And the first route is the Christian social route. The second route is the liberal route. Mm. And the third route is the conservative route. Mm. And uh, I would put it that way in, in this kind of picture. If you cut one of the roots, the whole tree will be damaged. Uh, so all the three roots are very important, but the art is to keep all these three roots in kind of a balance so that the conservative route will not be the dominant one, but also the Christian social route will not be the dominant one. And also the liberal will not be the dominant one. And I think this more, let's say, balanced thinking is very important. Uh, uh, of course, this is always also uh, the way to kind of defame the CDU uh, by, by the rather left uh, spectrum to, to call it conservative because it puts it in one corner. Uh, but I think we should uh, defend this a little bit without saying we are not conservative, uh, for God's sake, but to say we are, yeah. so to say threefold, we are conservative, we are liberal, and we are uh, Christian social. Yeah. So I think that's very important to, to bring these three roots together. And if we are talking about roots, uh, I would come back to the, to the, to, to the question of uh, modernity perspectives, postmodern uh, perspectives, I think it's very important that we go back to the roots, and I would dare to say to the grassroots. Uh, the CDU started as a movement, uh, and it started, and and that was very important for me to stress in my uh, in my lecture. It started on the ground. It started locally, and I think this is very important. We shouldn't uh, forget our local roots. Mm -hmm. uh, and if we look at local, I don't know how much this is the same uh, uh, thing in, in Scandinavia, but if we look at the, uh, the local politics in, in Germany, I think we still have to make very clear that these local uh, politics are very, very important. I mean, Adenauer started as a local politician, as the Lord Mayor of Cologne. And this made him very, very popular and very strong. And there he gained all the experiences he needed for his political career. Mm. And the second uh, dimension of what I'm saying here is that we should not look somewhat arrogant on movements. Mm. Uh, either you call it Friday for Future or whatever you call it, you call it the ecological movement. We should, without uh, without uh, not uh, without denying our own uh, convictions, we should be very inviting to these movements, uh, because the danger that those movements would uh, maybe go to a rather, I would say, anti-democratic mm. uh, view of if you don't change, we have to change the system. Mm. Uh, I think it's very important to pull these people uh, into, let's say. The, uh, the the representative uh, political system. Uh, and, and here we should be very, very, very ambitious. Mm -hmm. thank, thank you so much. Uh, one last word, because I know yeah. that uh, Michael Borchardt has to leave the airport. Yeah. The, the last <laughs> okay. word is just uh, this about conservatism. Perhaps it could be solved, this question or answered, uh, that if you look upon conservatism, 
conservatism as a disposition, then you know it's it's not it's it it has to be founded on something, and the foundation then would be let's say natural law and personalism concerning the, those two uh, very important lessons from Conrad Adenauer: Christian ethics and and Christian view of man or personalism, and then it's it's something more absolute, not a disposition. You know, you could have conservatives in Russia who, who long for the communist state and so on. Great. Thank you so much for we and really excellent discussion. And I would like to, um, or to if you want to, to, to tell that again, you can watch it again on YouTube. I think it's really worth to, to go into it again. Thank you so much again our two, uh, two speakers. And we will be very glad to, to go continue with that topic. Uh, in online seminars. Yeah, thank you, Per Landgren, and thank you, Michael Borkert, for really uh, an ex ex excellent uh, contributions. And I wish everybody uh, a nice rest of the day. Yeah, thank you. Hope thank you, you, you so much. Thank yeah. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.